Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning about the winter of birds with expert Mark Faherty. I'm Arun Roth, uh, the host of GBH's All Things Considered. You might hear me afternoons on your radio. And uh, I'm hosting this afternoon's event. I'm also a big bird and birding enthusiast. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. In particular, a special thanks to our Beacon Circle members. Thank you for your generous support. You make something like this possible. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to say just a friendly reminder uh, that unlike us, you will not be on video. We cannot see or hear you. However, we can receive your questions and we need your questions for this uh, seminar to, uh, to, to work. If you have a question you want to ask our expert, uh, you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in the question there. Uh, as always, we want to know where you are, so if you wouldn't mind also typing in where you are tuning in from, uh, so we know that. And uh, also, if you happen to see a question that you would like to see answered, uh, put a thumbs up next to it. Or if you see somebody is already asking the question you want to ask, just go in and put a thumbs up next to that. That way, uh, the questions with the most thumbs up will go sort of to the head of, of my queue, and the ones that are most important to everybody uh, will be answered first. Uh, a couple of other quick notes before we jump in. Uh, there's a closed captioning feature. To turn that on, click the live transcript button at, button at the bottom of your screen. There are, there are two live transcription delays that will pop up. Uh, what we recommend is you use a uh, subtitle. That just puts the captioning right at the bottom of your screen as we go. The other option is full transcript. That puts up a sidebar that has everything transcribed uh, as we're going so you can see as what each, each speaker is, is saying. Uh, please bear in mind that the captioning might be slightly delayed. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into it. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Mark, sorry, I, I did that once before. Mark, Mark uh, Faherty. Uh, Mark has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary since 2007. He's led birding trips for Mass Audubon since 2002. He is past president of the Cape Cod Bird Club and is a current member of the Massachusetts Avian Records Committee. Mark, thanks so much. It's great to have you. The per perfect person to talk about winter birds with. Well, thanks, Aaron. Just kidding, Arun. Just kidding. <laughs> just getting you back. I deserve you know, one, it. Uh, uh, happy to do it. You know, at one point I thought I heard you say you were a big bird, uh, and I got excited. I was going to get my kids, but uh, you said you're a big bird enthusiast. I am also. To, I'm also a big, you to big that. bird enthusiast. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yes, I'm also enthusiastic about big bird. Yes. Uh, so we're going to have, uh, I'm sure, some great questions, as we always do from our audience here. But uh, I get to start off, and, and let me start off with something that we were talking about before uh, we, we got on air, which is that, well, we've had a, a pretty mild winter so far, and uh, wondering if um, that uh, that changes uh, the, how the birding season, you know, the way that the birds were expecting to see in the wintertime. Yeah. I mean, think of how much we complain about the weather, and we have houses. <laughs> Imagine how it affects things for the birds. Yes, um, and this is an increasingly familiar story like, hey, when's winter coming? Um, and then maybe in sometime in February, you get a deep freeze that gives you some semblance of winter. But overall, our winters have been getting much milder. Um, and people, people are aware of this in different ways. I have different family members who went in on backyard skating rinks this year. And I was like, eh. I don't think that's going to be a big growth industry going forward. You know, uh, uh, some of my friends and I will go ice fishing in Southern Maine every year and that, you know, the lake, the, the rivers don't even freeze. Um, and so, yeah, things are different now and it definitely affects the birds. People see it affecting the plants as well. You know, their brother is complaining his daffodils are coming up and now they're going to freeze and he won't get any flowers in the spring. So winters have definitely gotten weird. Um, and so some things don't come south when it's this warm because because they can stay further north. Like maybe we don't see as many ducks because the ponds to our north have not frozen over. One of the fun things about winter birding in Massachusetts is all the different kinds of ducks, freshwater and saltwater. And one thing that brings them down here is the deep freezes they typically get further north. And we can usually count on that. It's much warmer here than it is in, you know, northern Vermont, um, places like that. And so the ducks will come down here when everything freezes over. But 
um, it's been pretty warm all around in, in New England. Um, and so, you know, maybe we're not seeing as many ducks. Um, you know, the birds might not come to the bird feeders as much. You know, they have open water. I do heated bird baths, uh, but that is probably not in as much demand with the birds when, you know, here on the Cape where I am, I mean, nothing's freezing. It's it's rarely been below freezing he, here on the Cape. Uh, and so all of that, <clears throat> it could affect the birds in positive ways. Birds can, can stay further north. Uh, they can survive longer through the winter. They don't need to eat as much when it's warmer. I mean, that's the big that's the big deal for a bird trying to survive the winter is getting enough calories to survive the night. And when you see that the winters are probably five degrees warmer than they were 40, 50 years ago, and that matters in terms of how much food the birds need to eat and uh, their survival rate. Um, they're able to survive at a higher rate through the night uh, because the nights just just aren't as cold. So that was sort of rambling, but there are just all these different ways that this these warmer winters affect birds and birding right well i guess you know it, it affects everything as we know um so and then the broader picture of of winter uh birds and and birding in in the winter um i've heard a lot of people say that that cape cod is kind of an ideal place to start birding i mean i'm having to do with the, the the birds that kind of come up and down the, uh, the the east coast. So for for the winter, uh, say I'm I'm going to come down there for the first time. I want to do some birding. What's uh What's exciting about uh, what we'll see in, in winter there? Yeah, but the winter birding on the Cape is really good. Um, and I think you're right. I think particularly for a beginner, um, because ducks is a big part of that, right? So you can go to one of the harbors. And I'm kind of an outer Cape guy. It's where I've done most of my work uh, over the years, you know, from East Ham out to Provincetown. And we have a couple of the best harbors for going to see and photograph, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> ducks. And in winter, we have a lot more ducks than we do in, in the breeding season. There's almost nothing duck wise. You know, we have mallards and American black ducks and really not much else. In the winter, we have this big influx of three kinds of mergansers, common eiders by the literally the hundreds of thousands, scoters by the hundreds of thousands, depending on where you look, like off Monomoy. There are just great clouds of these big, heavy sea ducks that come down here in the winter. The biomass of, of these ducks coming down here to eat shellfish is, is almost unimaginable. And you can see those pretty close. Um, certain beaches and particularly the harbors, like I'm saying, and a lot of people are getting into photography now and ducks are very, uh, very showy and easy to photograph. And so places like Wellfleet Harbor, Provincetown Harbor, you can get close looks at something like a long-tailed duck, which is kind of an exotic bird for your average person. This is an Arctic nesting duck with a beautiful black, white, and gray plumage and brown, um, and males have a long tail very elegant looking, kind of a startling looking duck. It's just not your typical, you know, mallard at the pond where you go to feed the ducks. Um, but you can see these in the harbors and you can get photos of them. Um, and not just ducks, but there are other seabirds, these kind of exotic seabirds that come down in the winter that are not on the radar screen of your average backyard bird or something like a razorbill or a common myrrh. These are the penguins of the north. And they breed much further north of here in these big cliffside colonies, some of them in burrows. And we only get a chance to see them in the cold months. And sometimes a place like Provincetown Harbor is a good place to go. And you could see them just sort of paddling around there. Um, in addition to the fact that... What's the name the, of those? Oh, sorry, that, the name of that bird again? Uh, it's a group of birds called alcids. The most common one is called a razorbill. And you can see razorbills going by some of the ocean and bayside <coughs> beaches on the outer cape and mid-cape, excuse me, this time of year. Um, and then sometimes you can see them up close in the different harbors or sometimes off some of the beaches, um, maybe like Corporation Beach in Dennis or, you know, Wellfleet Harbor, or Provincetown Harbor, good places to, to look for these things. Um, but we also have a lot of songbirds here that um, enjoy the fact that we have open water all winter and, and just overall warmer temperatures during the winter and, and no snow cover for things that like to feed on the ground. 
Um, I want to hear more about the songbirds. First, I want to remind uh, our audience that uh, we want your questions for Mark. Uh, you can open that Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type your questions in there. If you see a question you want answered, vote for it by clicking the, the thumbs up. Um, yeah, talk in a bit more detail about the, uh, about the, the, the songbirds. Right. Um, so Southeastern Mass is a good place for, um, say you watch your backyard bird feeders, um, roving flocks of bluebirds that often have pine warblers mixed in. Um, and, and so I can expect at some point during the day, uh, especially on colder days, to get a flock of nine or 12 Eastern bluebirds that come into my yard. They particularly like the suet, uh, but they do okay. They don't need bird feeders. They eat fruit in the winter, but they can also still find insects kind of rooting around in the grass and, and under the leaves. Um, and they're often accompanied by pine warblers, which is a, a beautiful little yellow warbler that's hardier than most warblers. Most warblers leave and head to Central and South America for the winter. Um, and birders really enjoy seeing those in, in May and then again in the fall as they come through the area in migration. But they leave for the winter for the most part. But there are a few warblers that do stay for the winter and they will come to your feeders like uh, I mentioned pine warbler, but also yellow rumped warbler, another one that I get in my yard pretty much every day. Um, and so if you put out suet, that's a good, uh, that fat, that rendered fat, you could buy those little pre-made suet cakes at the store. And um, that that tends to get the bluebirds and the and the warblers in my yard. Uh, and we we have some um, uh, questions now coming up. I didn't realize I didn't have my own Q and A tab up, so I'm 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 sorry, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so first uh, from uh, Lydia in uh, in Natick, uh, we were just talking about about feeders, and I'm I'm actually somebody that. Um, I don't didn't have feeders in the summer. Winter is when I when I when I have them have them going. It seems like mm -hmm. it's the most fun. Uh, she's asking how how often I have the same question. How often do you recommend uh, washing the feeders? They do a lot of traffic. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and the recommendation is to wash them every week with um, diluted bleach. And the concern is. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, certain diseases like there's a, a conjunctivitis that house finches get. Um, and there are other diseases that birds get. So it's just good practice to keep your feeders clean, take them down, uh, soak them in a, <clears throat> a mild bleach solution is the general recommendation. And you'll see that many, many places, Cornell, National Audubon, Mass Audubon, all the different bird organizations will tell you the same thing. We have uh, Carol from uh, Carol from Abingdon uh, has a question about our. Uh, she asks, "Are birds getting their spring feathers early?" She says, "My finches seem redder than I would expect in January." And Carol, I, I would say, uh, I also same thing. We we have finches on our feeder here, and they're they're looking pretty gloriously red right now. Uh, house finches look the same year round. Um, no. it, Usually the the finch the finch to watch is the American goldfinch, and they're already starting to get a little bit of their yellow plumage, and that'll happen slowly over the course of the rest of the winter into spring. Will you watch your goldfinches? You know you'll see this bright yellow feather pop up, um, and then at a certain point, all of a sudden they're really yellow. Uh, it really accelerates as you get towards spring, and it's a funny thing with goldfinches because they're not they won't breed until July. Um, I mean, there are some that will breed in, in the spring, the normal time when other birds uh, would normally breed, like May and June, but uh, American goldfinches are famous for being the last of the breeding songbirds, and they wait until some of the flowers have gone to seed because they only eat seeds. They don't eat insects. They're very, very unusual among songbirds. <clears throat> most songbirds eat insects and feed insects to their chicks, most importantly even if you perceive them as a seed eater, like a cardinal. Uh, but goldfinches actually are, are exclusively seed eaters, which so they breed quite late, but still um, they'll start molting into breeding plumage in mid to late winter, very slowly. And then eventually it'll accelerate, but cardinals and, and house finches, and you know, they pretty much look the same year round. Uh, speaking of cardinals, uh, Eleanor in uh, Stores, Connecticut, uh, asks, when do cardinals generally appear? Uh, can you talk about uh, migration with cardinals? Yeah, they don't really migrate. Um, there's some amount of <clears throat> movement, uh, dispersal of young birds. 
um, but they don't migrate, <coughs> excuse me, in the sense that other birds migrate. Um, and there are all these different kinds of migration. There's the fly south for the winter migration that people are familiar with. I talked about that earlier with warblers. Um, and then there are short distance migrants that can be more flexible, things like robins. Robins can dictate how far south they go in any given winter based on the food resources they're finding as they roam around. And they don't, necess they don't have a destination that they're going to. They're just roaming around looking for food. Some of them will go south, some of them not so much. Bluebirds are like that too. Um, but some of our most familiar backyard birds don't migrate in any real sense. Chickadees, titmice. Um, and as a result, some of them don't like to cross <coughs> water at all, excuse me. Um, and so titmice didn't get over to uh, Martha's Vineyard for, for quite a long time because they don't like to cross water. Um, but the young birds do disperse and at bird banding stations where they catch birds that are migrating and little these baby fine mist nets, they will get an influx. They will get movements of young chickadees and cardinals and things like that. But for the most part, if adults have a good territory, they'll keep it year round. I, I know that uh, here in uh, our backyard, we're, we're abutting conservation land and uh, we have a, a multiple generations of, of characters of blue jays, uh, robins, cardinals that, that we um, have, you know, know the individuals of because they've been around so, so long now with us. Right. Um, blue, blue jays do migrate. And you can actually, they're one of the few birds, that, songbirds that migrate during the day. And so you'll see these big flocks of blue jays moving during the day and fall. But they're also a flexible short distance migrant that are um, reading the landscape for food resources. With them, it's, it's mostly acorns and other mast producing trees, as wildlife biologists say, things like beaches uh, that produce you know, hard nuts that, that blue jays like. And so if they find a lot of acorns, then they'll stop and they won't go any further south, but they will migrate. But, uh, you know, there are the rare winters where our oaks don't produce a lot of acorns, where you're having a hard time finding a blue jay. Most years we have them. The oaks kind of stagger their, their mass production enough that we have blue jays pretty much every winter. But I can remember winters where it was, it was difficult to find a blue jay as I went around doing my various Christmas bird counts that I do each year. I definitely see with it with the crowds of them like they, they will take off for long periods how, how far will a group go as they're doing that localized uh migration you're talking about blue jays yeah uh you know i don't have a good sense of that they'll go until they find a good crop of uh acorns or or uh, mostly acorns they might go to the ozarks <laughs> you know one year if they're not finding anything in the northeast um, but they're not going to, you know, Central America or, or um, beyond the way a lot of kind of longer distance migrants would be. At the other end of the spectrum, you have some of the shorebirds that will migrate from, you know, the Arctic to almost the Antarctic and terns, things like Arctic terns, um, godwits, these big lanky sandpipers that do these incredible migrations. And so you can kind of you, you get the, the sense of the different ends of the spectrum with migration, you know, red knots and bar tailed godwits just going from one end of the earth to the other, these strong athletic shorebirds. And then, you know, your your local robins that may stay or they might go a, a couple of states away in search of uh, fruiting trees and shrubs. We have a couple of uh, woodpecker questions. I'll start with uh, Nancy, who asks how to prevent woodpeckers from making holes in the shingles. The classic, the classic question for every nature center uh, in Mass Audubon um, has a kind of a frequently asked questions page because we've always had this wildlife helpline where people call up and ask questions like that. And so there's a, a website to sort of preemptively answer the most common questions. Um, and that's always one of them. And so you know, it's, it's sort of situational. There are different things that have been recommended over the years, mylar strips to, to scare them away. And people have tried, you know, recordings of hawks and things like that. And I don't really have a sense of how well any of those things work. The reality is, um, say it's your rake boards, you might want to get those replaced with, um, you know, the AZEC or whatever, if you have a chance to do that, and then you don't have to worry about it. If it's your cedar shingles like me, the 
ungrateful woodpeckers that come and damage my house. And I lean out the window and I say, do you know who I am? <laughs> and they still, they just keep pecking away. They could care less. Uh, you know, it's been sort of dispersed and I've just let it happen. Um, but if they're really hammering a particular area, like they're going after carpenter bee larvae is something that happens a lot. Uh, the carpenter bees, you may not have noticed, but they um, laid eggs. They have chambers inside your rake boards or something like that. And the woodpeckers know those juicy larvae are in there. And they'll open up that line of holes along your rake board trying to get at the carpenter to get at the carpenter bee larvae. Um, so that's a question where you might want to just replace the rake boards. In other cases, you can get netting and just put netting up over the area. Um, that's pretty foolproof. You just have, you know, some nice tight, the kind of netting that you put over your blueberry plants or whatever. You get at any hardware store or garden store, bird netting. Um, and you can try that. But, you know, physically keeping them away from, from the area. With, with, with it up, I, I got to share a story because I actually went through a, a bit of an ordeal with a, with a local woodpecker and uh, consulted with our local Audubon. And we did a, a, a story about it. But um, this character, he actually uh, got through the wood and made a little hollow out. And uh, what we came up with was once uh, making sure that he was actually out of the hole that time, uh, sealing it up and then putting what was really nice birdhouse right in front of it and uh, did that. Uh, he came back and checked it out and rejected it. And some sparrows moved in. I was so brokenhearted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't see it. He didn't really come back to it after that. Right. Um... <laughs> Yeah, woodpeckers don't use birdhouses as often as you would think. They kind of, um, it was you know, such a like fine, to... nice birdhouse. I'm sure it was, and I'm sure it hurt. I know, I know the feeling. Um, but they like to make their own. You know, they're uh, they're what's called a, a primary cavity nester, and so a lot of other birds depend on woodpeckers to excavate those cavities. Um, so everything from bats to flying squirrels to certain small owls depend on woodpeckers to to make those cavities. So like a northern flicker makes a hole that an eastern screech owl or a northern saw wet owl could use to, to nest in. And a downy woodpecker makes a smaller hole that, you know, a nuthatch might take over. Nuthatches and chickadees can also excavate their own cavities. But a lot of other things, um, cavity nesting birds like a great crested flycatcher, one of my favorite birds, it's a, a flycatcher that actually nests in cavities and they depend on woodpeckers to to be the primary excavators and and then they just uh they're part of sort of the secondary housing market <laughs> you know they come in and and buy buy used yeah I like, like the sparrows occupying the birdhouse that that the woodpeckers are responsible for <laughs> yeah yeah the house sparrows are tough i mean especially if you're in the city that's what you'll get in a birdhouse and um you know they can be a problem they were a problem for bluebirds they were one of the reasons that bluebirds declined they would take over the houses and they're pretty violent um those little kind of brownish gray familiar sparrows of the city house sparrows are they're from europe and asia and um the funny thing is they're declining a lot of places um as farmland has declined but we're not putting them on the endangered species list just yet. They're they're not native to this continent, and they've they've caused quite a few problems. And they're pretty they they will kill chicks and even adults of other cavity nesting birds like bluebirds and and tree swallows, and they'll destroy the eggs. And so, uh, yeah, they're tough. I mean, they're like the mafia. They're just going around. They're like, hey, you want to nest here? You know, and they're just like smashing heads together and breaking eggs and uh and so they, they're not something you want if you're say taking care of a bluebird a bunch of bluebird or tree swallow nest boxes because they they cause trouble and what um, we do just to finish that thought what we do uh at mass audubon is we will have fake house sparrow eggs and so you'll you'll leave them alone in some box and then you give them these little eggs made out of modeling clay that fools them and they keep incubating and they don't actually raise any young but they don't bother the other birds also and so that's that's been a good a good trick so if you if you have nest boxes that you're managing for bluebirds and whatever and you end up with house sparrows it's good to have a plan for dealing with them to make sure that you're not just pumping out these invasive species that's a that's a wild interesting and kind of brilliant solution um 
So uh, back to uh, back to woodpeckers. Uh, Francis in Oxford uh, is asking about the uh, red-bellied uh, woodpecker, uh, loving uh, a frequent visitor. It always seems to be a female, and uh, Francis asking if that's an ordinary winter pattern. You know, that's a good question. I notice I've been I've been mainly seeing a, a female. Um, and if you walk around your neighborhood and listen, you'll notice that there are there are probably three or four red-bellied woodpeckers around. Um, and so there is a male somewhere, but um, I, I make that same observation. And this is one of my favorite species. They weren't really around when I was a kid. I started birding when I was six, growing up in Brockton, and we didn't have red-bellied woodpeckers back then. Uh, this was, you know, I was born in the 70s. So it really the, the 80s, 1980 is probably when I started birding. And I saw my first red-bellied woodpecker in New Jersey you know, visiting my sister year, uh, many years ago. But now, you know, they're up into northern Vermont, really. Uh, and so that's a bird that has made a rapid northward march over the years um, in in response, in part, to the these milder winters that we have, because they don't migrate either. But in terms of why you're ju seeing just a female, I don't have a good answer for that. Eventually, they do need to find each other to make more red-bellied woodpeckers, and they will. They will. But maybe they are, uh, you know, just hanging out at different feeders. You know, um, separate vacations can really help a relationship. A lot of you know that. So is that a bird then where global warming, it's it's kind of a good opportunity for it? It's been able to expand its range? Yeah. I mean, there are birds where that seems to be the case. And, and that's one of the classic examples. And it's these backyard type birds that don't migrate. We talked about that earlier, the species that don't migrate. Um, Carolina wren is another one. Carolina wrens were not common when I was a kid. You know, they are. They're every I see them all the time here now. They're very, very common. And we in the house know, the other day. Yes. And <laughs> and they're very loud. They let you know they're around. They're like a little bird with a megaphone. Um, and they were not that common and they don't migrate. And we know that harsh winters will kill them off. I mean, that's been very obvious to see. You don't even need to do any particular kind of research to, to see this. Um, I remember a very severe winter within the last 10 years where even on the Cape, we had like three feet of snowpack. It was crazy. And and the, the Carolina Wrens crashed after that winter, and then they had to build their numbers back up. Um, they could do that fairly quickly, but it took, it took several years. Um, and so with milder winters, they have been able to expand north. Um, they do use bird feeders, but not as much as some other species. Um, they're surprisingly good at finding things like spiders and spider egg cases all winter long. They do like houses and they like foraging around the base of your house, um, you know, in the basement windows and things like that and around your shed and stuff like that. And um, finding the spiders and other insect egg cases here and there. Um, but yes, they've certainly benefited from from milder winters. That seems fairly obvious. So that, that must be the uh, the one, because I've I mentioned one actually got in our house the other day. I have no idea yeah. how it got inside. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, they've nested inside people's houses while the people were living in them. There are some famous stories. Um, some people just didn't have a have their screen down or whatever, and they had their, their windows open a lot. So some Carolina wrens came in and nested in a plastic, like a solo cup in that had scrunchies in it in their bathroom. <laughs> and they just let it, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and they just let them go. And eventually the chicks fledged onto the bathroom floor. Um, another pair nested in a hole in the back of a couch. Uh, I feel like this was not the best kept house uh, I, you've ever seen. Um, but another, you know, open window, and they'll certainly they'll get into garages and sheds and nest inside them. And um, their favorite place to nest is inside a propane tank lid. Uh, you know, for those of us in in kind of seasonal areas where there are a lot of propane tanks, um, there's like a hole in the side of the lid, and it's enclosed, and it's a great place for a Carolina wren to to make a nest. <laughs> nice and cozy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen uh, from Sharon uh, is asking, uh, how many years can one expect the same birds to return to your feeder? Um, yeah, the most songbirds don't live very long, you know, two, three, four <laughs> years. 
a really old songbird would be like nine, 10, 11 years old. Um, other birds, bigger birds live longer. An eagle might live 50 years. Seabirds can live 25, 30 years or more. Parrots live a long time. If you've ever tried, you know, bought a parrot, uh, hopefully you inquired about their lifespan before you bought them because they live 50 years. Um, but your average songbird has a short, brutish life. Um, you know, it, it, for a lot of them, migration is the hardest part of hardest part of their year. Um, but yeah, two, three, four, six years. What about? Let me ask about what one of our our other uh, frequent visitors to our feeder, not not for the feeder, but to feed on other birds. Uh, we have a red-tailed hawk. How, how long do red-tailed hawks uh, live in the wild? It's a good question. I would guess based on their size, sort of extrapolating from other species, they could live 25, 30 years. Wow. Um, I'll have to look into that. Related, uh, Sue asks a, a question, which is, um, uh, is there a somewhat easy way to tell a Cooper's hawk from a sharp shinned hawk? <laughs> could, could you maybe describe both these birds yes. for us to, to start off? Sure. Uh, there are two species of woodland, kind of small, sleek, long-tailed woodland hawk. So they're smaller and slimmer than a red tail. Red-tailed hawk is your standard roadside hawk, you know, hunting the highway median strip as you drive around. And they're very, very common in Boston. Red-tailed hawks are very, very common in Boston. They love hunting squirrels and pigeons. The Cooper's hawk is sort of a crow-sized, slender, long-tailed hawk. And a sharp-shinned hawk is blue jay size, really. A male sharp-shinned hawk is not much bigger than a blue jay, if at all. And then the female is slightly bigger. So the biggest would be a female Cooper's hawk, and the smallest would be a male sharp-shinned hawk. But they look very similar. Long tail, immatures have streaky brown breasts, uh, brown streaks on their, on their white breasts um brownish heads the adults are beautiful kind of a, a black cap and hood in the case of a sharp shinned hawk and then beautiful reddish barring underneath um, mainly we see the young birds that are kind of brown and streaky and these are the, the the hawks that are famous for hunting backyard bird feeders they're very fast they primarily eat birds cooper's hawks also eat things like squirrels and chipmunks um I'd say sharp shin hawks probably eat a higher percentage birds, but mainly bird hunting. So they're built for fast pursuit of birds through forests and and shrubberies and thickets. And um, they'll dive into a dense, you know, um, privet hedge or something like that and come out the other side with a house sparrow. In terms of telling them apart, this is just an age old dilemma for for beginning birders to to advance birders, really. Um, um, you know, in flight, there's just some subtle differences in the shape of the wings and the way they flap. And Cooper's hawks, are, on average, have a more rounded tail with more white at the end of the tail. And they tend to have these fluffy white undertail feathers. Um, the Cooper's hawk's head sticks out further from the wings. The leading edge of the wing is straighter on a Cooper's hawk. So there's a sort of menu of ways to tell them apart. and Whenever you see one, you have to put all of these things together. And if you see a picture of them perched, say, on someone's deck and on social media, people are always posting pictures of what is this? Because perched hawks are very difficult to identify, even for intermediate and experienced birders oftentimes. Um, but you're looking at the head. A sharp-shinned hawk has a round little head with a big eye right in the middle. And then the Cooper's hawk has a bigger, flatter, Frankensteinian kind of head, relatively speaking. So there are all these subtle things that you can get down with experience, but it, it's all relative. Size is tough. Um, size is the way that beginners go wrong and, and experienced birders go wrong. Very difficult to tell the size of a lone bird. And so you need some sort of frame of reference. So it's good to not kid yourself about your perception of the size of things because it's it's often wrong, and and even if even if you have a lot of experience, it sounds like you know naked eye and from a distance, it, it's it's awfully hard. Oh yeah, you you have to let some go, and that's that's a sign of an experienced birder is knowing what you don't know. 
huh. and you see young birders coming up and it's sort of like birding on steroids and you know don't leave leave nothing unidentified uh, a more experienced birder knows to let certain things go like a quick look at an intermediate sized excipiter that's the group of hawks that coopers and sharp shin hawks are in the excipiters um, and so you see kind of an intermediate one flying away. It's tempted, just tempting to say, yeah, it's a Cooper sock, but you know, better to just let it go. These are so many great questions. So many, I would be putting the thumbs up too as well, because I, I have similar questions. Uh, thank you all of you for all of your questions. I want to take just a moment now to introduce my colleague, Liz. Liz, welcome. Hi, everyone, and thank you for spending some time with us today alongside our birding expert, Mark Faherty. Viewers and listeners tune into GBH for many reasons, whether that's to experience the joy of birding, learn the latest news, or simply just to be entertained for a little bit. If GBH is your go-to source of entertainment, news, education, or culture, please consider making a donation today. If you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, or make a one-time gift of $60, we will be sending you a gray GBH short sleeve t-shirt as a special thank you. This way you can show your support and love for GBH wherever you go. So to get your shirt and to make your donation, simply go to gbh.org slash support events. You can also text the keyword GBH to the number 800-204-3811 to find that donation page. Giving just takes a few moments of your time and a few dollars on your credit card, and we promise it will be a great use of your time today. If you are considering becoming a member today, please check out our chat tab so you can find the link and all that other information there. If you are already a member, thank you so very much for joining us. We're really happy to have you here. Now we'll turn it back over to our discussion and keep the questions coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. And uh, I, I just want to take a second to underscore everything that, that Liz said as somebody who's on the air with GBH every day. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, it makes everything that we do possible. Uh, and it, it means a lot for uh, just to know that you support us as well as actually getting the material support. We, we deeply appreciate it. Uh, so let's get back into uh, the, these wonderful questions. I want to get as many of these in as possible. Uh, Michelle is asking about uh, robins in the winter here in New England, uh, asking why they're here, because uh, Michelle seems to recall that they migrated in the winter. Yeah, uh, this is a really common question, and this is... Um sort of an old myth that never dies, you know, the, the first robin of spring, but uh, they never leave. <laughs> and so how could you have the first robin of spring? It's the first robin that people notice when it gets towards the mud season and, you know, March and April, and then all of a sudden they see a big flock of robins on a muddy median strip or something. Like, hey, robins, or they're, you know, their backyard. Um, but robins are here, like even in Berkshire County, um, all, all winter long. And they basically become wandering frugivores, meaning a species that eats fruit. It's not all they eat in the winter, um, but it, you know they switch from eating worms on your lawn uh, and other insects, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to wandering around in sometimes big flocks looking for fruit to eat. And so they love to eat things like um, uh, ornamental crab apple, if you have ornamental crab apples, you probably know this because they come to your yard and skeletonize your, your tree. Um, and then certain native things like uh, winterberry is a great one. This is a, a great native species to plant in your yard. It's great for bees in the spring, but um, and then it has these bright red fruits all winter long and, until the robins get to them. Um, but what might happen is that our, lo our local robins kind of slip away in fall and then you, you may not notice there are just there aren't that many robins for a while and then you'll get some cold fronts and all of a sudden you'll see these high flocks of robins coming in during a late october cold front through november and those are northern robins coming in and they might stay they might keep going there might be more northern robins that come in as as the winter goes on but they they wander around um, but they don't 
leave the area completely like something like a yellow warbler. There are zero yellow warblers in the winter. They're common breeding warbler in kind of wet thickets all across the state, really, really common. And they just leave all together. And then they come back in May. Um, even things like Orioles now. Orioles increasingly seem to be spending the winter on Cape Cod here. And a few people have picked up on that and they just leave their jelly feeders out. You know, those grape jelly feeders that people put out for Baltimore Orioles. There's somebody in Dennis where they just leave it out. And I go there on the Christmas bird count. And last year they had five Orioles in late December coming to their feeders. Um, and so uh, cat birds, people, you know, their, their backyard cat birds leave and overwhelmingly go to Central America for the winter. But uh, you can find quite a few cat birds if you know how to find them here in winter in coastal thickets where they, they eat fruit. Um, robins are sort of the most obvious example of that because they're in these big roving flocks. Those all of a sudden you just look out here on the Cape where we don't tend to get snow cover. I'll look out, there's just 70 robins on the grass of my neighbor's lawn out here. Um, uh, and they're here and, and there are, they roost in big flocks together. And that's something that um, you can see it, it very obviously in certain places on the Cape. There's one place in Barnstable where there's a, a robin roost of up to 30,000 robins come going into the roost at night here in, in the winter. There's another one elsewhere, like closer to Hyannis that they counted 10,000 robins going in. So we have a lot of robins in the winter. <laughs> sort of a, a long way of saying, yes, robins are here. There are lots of them. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned Orioles. I'm, I'm kind of curious if, if that is another bird that maybe has extended its range, because I, I grew up in Maryland, and the first time I saw an Oriole was here in Lexington, and not when it was super warm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you weren't a baseball fan? <laughs> there, there are some Orioles in Maryland. Uh, um. They have not, I don't think they've expanded their breeding range very much, at least not in comparison with the species we talked about before, where it's a gi gigantic leap in a relatively short amount of time. Things like even cardinals, mockingbirds, titmice, all of those things made huge range expansions. Um, Orioles, maybe. Um, I, I think just about everything is expanding its range at the very northern end. It's creeping north. Um, I would say they've probably expanded their um, wintering range a bit north. It's always been typical that you could find a few Orioles in Florida. You know, they don't all go to Central America. Um, but, you know, more and more of them are around here uh, in the winter, which which just seems interesting. And they can do fine. They don't need to be going to a jelly feeder. They can eat things like uh, eastern red cedar fruits, those little cones that look like a little little blue, dusty blue berry on cedar trees, it's a really important bird food. And then they'll eat some of the invasive things like oriental bittersweet and things like that. And they can they can get through the winter on that stuff. They can find insects. So yeah, Orioles are, are surprisingly tough, but probably taking advantage of, of these milder winters as well. A question about uh, dark-eyed juncos. And uh, I mentioned that I've, I've only just started putting my, my, my feeders out in the winter. It's usually, it's a junco that's usually my cue one of them will come to the window and say, hey, dude, it's 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 time. Um, uh, but uh, Betsy in Monroe and in, in Franklin County, uh, Massachusetts mm. asks, uh, is used to seeing uh, usually a large flock, 30 individuals, uh, Betsy says, came over like the previous five years, but for some reason not coming to the feeders uh, this year is, is, is wondering why that might be. Yeah, that's always a difficult question to answer. Juncos should be really common pretty much everywhere. They don't winter in huge numbers on the Cape. They prefer to stay in more wooded areas, more inland. And where she is, juncos actually breed. Um, I'm pretty sure they definitely breed in, in that county, certainly in the higher elevations. Um, you know, they don't breed here where, where I am on Cape Cod um, or in any of the coastal plain areas, but they will they will breed in like the highlands of Worcester County and things like that. Um, and so I'm, I'm surprised that you're not seeing normal numbers of, of juncos. It's hard to say what's happening, whether it's a local phenomenon or whether it's this thing that I talked about where um, maybe things are just wintering further north. 
there are certain sparrows that we don't see as much anymore in winter. One of them is the American tree sparrow, which is a lot like a junco. It's a winter only sparrow for most of us in the state. It kind of, uh, it's a beautiful little sparrow, slender with a chestnut cap and a black spot on the breast. And they like brushy farmland um, in the winter, but they have been declining precipitously across the continent according to Christmas bird count data. But one, one of the theories is that maybe they're just staying a little bit further north, um, but they could also be experiencing climate change impacts in their breeding range, which is in kind of subarctic Canada and Alaska, places like that where climate change is having a lot of impacts. Um, but yeah, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that someone in Franklin County is not getting their normal slug of juncos. It's hard to say what's going on, but possibly they just stayed a little further north. And uh, just uh, speaking of those birds, you know, I I only ever see them tend to as like individuals, like like, like one or or, or two. Uh, you said that they 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 are in the bigger flocks, so like you know, further further inland. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes over a hundred, um, certainly dozens. Here in the Cape, we get more modest numbers. Like I get, you know, if I see a dozen, that's a lot uh, for my neighborhood. Um, it seems to be more on the order of like five or six lately, um, but I do have them. So yeah, who, who's to say at the, at the hyper local level, it's hard to, to answer with any certainty what might be happening and really even at bit bigger scales, we're mostly just coming up with wild theories for what's happening. We have a follow-up question on uh, Orioles from uh, Bob in Jamaica Plain. Uh, uh, who was uh, in Easton for a while last summer and was wondering if um, if the Orioles, if they all uh, fly south or if some of them are staying around? Yeah, I think the questions are getting out of phase with my answers. I, I did talk about that um, at least once. Um, but that, so yes, some of them do stay in places like the Cape. It, it is getting a little easier to find a few Orioles, sometimes little groups of them. I remember one year doing a Christmas bird count in uh, a part of East Orleans, which tends to hold a lot of late songbirds um, here in the Outer Cape. And we found 11 Orioles, and this was you know mid-December when they should be long gone to, to Central America. And so, yeah, a handful of Orioles will make a go of it, um, even on the mainland too, but, but uh, certainly the coastal plain where it's warmer in the winter. Uh, the question um, from uh, Varla and Stephen in uh, Rentham, uh, who have noted a flock of bobo lynx in a large meadow across the way for a few years in early spring, but last year they didn't catch sight of them. Uh, wondering if bobo lynx are, are in any way threatened and uh, if they should expect to see them again. Yeah, that's a great question. One of my favorite species. So bobo lynx are, they're a grassland species. And there are species that I look at as a biologist, and I don't know why they're not endangered, because they tick all of the boxes for a species that should be all, all but extinct by now. They nest in pastures, like hay fields that get mowed every summer. And so their chicks are literally getting mowed. And then they're very long distance migrants which is a good way to be threatened <laughs> because a long distance migration is a sort of a death defying feat for a little songbird. And they're flying to like Argentina, Argentina, Brazil, grasslands of South America, places where they might even still be using DDT. You know, there's still a lot of pesticide use in, in places down there. There's a lot of human impacts, a lot of um, grazing impacts to the grasslands down there. So they're using these heavily impacted um, kind of anthropogenic landscapes in both breeding season and winter, and then doing these really long distance over the ocean migrations. But they're still around and that you go to certain places and they're still there year after year. You know, Mass Audubon and other organizations in New England have uh, band together for a bobbling project where people can donate money and, and that allows us to pay farmers to mow later. So they're, you're sort of paying farmers to grow bobolinks and, and kind of wait until later in the summer after the bobolinks have fledged to um, mow their hay. 
And this is this is such a great conservation project because it's so easy to get your head around. It's so tangible it, 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 and you know exactly what the money is going for. Um, and this has been very successful. Uh, but still, you know, your average hayfield gets mowed and it's it's just um, interesting that we have as many bottling still as we do, but very much a species of conservation concern for for organizations like Mass Audubon and, and that bottling project is a great one that people can look up. And uh, I don't know if people can hear that there, I have a conure shrieking in the background, which is uh, obviously <laughs> not not native. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm actually bumping up a question from Jerry in Brookline, uh, just because I wondered this myself a lot and never got around to asking it. And that's, a, you know, you mentioned that uh, the Carolina wrens uh, who can die during the, these cold snaps when it's bitterly cold. But what about the other birds that are around here in the winter? You know, all, all of our blue jays and robins and all of them. How do they maintain body heat during freezing temperatures and uh, keep going when it is especially at nighttime, so so incredibly cold? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, why isn't your conure like on your shoulder? Come on, people would love <laughs> to see. I assume it's a sun conure. Is it a sun conure? Ag agenda, actually. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's yeah, why, so, because he screams. <laughs> no, I know. I an ex-girlfriend who had a conure, yeah, they could be pretty noisy. Um, so yes, this, this is the big question in winter. You look out your window, and you're safe and warm in your house and these little chickadees like the size of your thumb and they're out there surviving freezing cold nights you hear the wind howling like how in god's name are these things surviving the winter and it's been well studied in chickadees it, it all comes down to food it's a very simple answer it's food and the other end of it is if you don't get enough food you don't wake up in the morning it's that simple. And so this has been a very strong selective pressure on birds in the Northern Hemisphere for a long time. And so they've had to develop all these adaptations. Um, it, um, greater intelligence is one of the most important ones. And there was a paper just recently looking at mountain chickadees out West and finding that the higher elevation birds where they have to deal with colder temperatures and greater food scarcity um, and higher food requirements to get through the night have bigger brains with more folds than lower elevation ones. So you can see these adaptations on a very small scale. And with chickadees, they have to know that they cache food, they store, and you, you can see this, you see them come to your feeders and they take something, they fly away. And the, the nuthatches do that, and the blue jays do that. The woodpeckers do that. A lot of these species that don't migrate will stash food, and they need to be able to find those again. They don't find all of them again. Um, but but that's, that's one of their adaptations, because it's all about you have to get a certain number of calories into your body for whatever the temperature is that night for you to wake up the next morning. And, and some birds can lower their metabolic rate Hummingbirds are famous for that. There are hummingbirds that live in pretty cold parts of the world, high elevation mountains in the Andes has some of the highest diversity of hummingbirds, has the highest diversity of hummingbirds in the world. And it gets cold there. They breed in Alaska. Rufus hummingbirds breed in coastal Alaska and places where it's cold and wet right through their breeding season. And so they have ways that they can lower their metabolism <clears throat> overnight uh, to, to get them through to the next day. So um, and then huddling together in cavities um, to, to reduce heat loss, fluffing up their feathers to, to um, trap air in the feathers and reduce heat loss, um, less heat loss through their feet. They can kind of shunt blood away from their feet. So they have all of these adaptations to help them uh, wake up the next day. But food is the most important thing, getting enough to eat. It was great, Mark. Along the way there, you answered Aaron's question from Seattle, Washington, who was asking the same thing about, about hummingbirds. It was nice you talked about that specifically. Um, super interesting. Uh, let me ask from um, uh, Charlene is asking uh, from actually one, one follow up on, on that that I was just thinking for, for that reason for in, in winter. Is it good like to give I know uh, I talked about my Blue Jays. I, I know they love uh, peanuts in shell because they can they can take those and, and stash them away for for later. So things like like peanuts in shell or or sunflower seeds are the, are the better things to give our winter birds to keep their their energy up for those cold nights. Geez, I'll take some peanuts in the shell. Some people feed their <laughs> birds better than I eat. I get people 
they call the show on WZAI like, yes, I've been feeding walnuts and pecans, you know, macadamia nuts. Like, geez, I'm coming over, <laughs> giving, giving those things to the birds. Come on. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly uh, things with a lot of fat um, are very helpful. Fat, you know, as we know from high school biology has twice as much energy as, as you know, carbohydrates or, or proteins. Uh, but they need all of it. Um, you know, a lot of the fruit that birds eat in the winter are kind of high sugar, low fat. So they have to eat more of them. Things like winterberry and American holly and um, greenbrier, things like that. These winter persistent fruits that birds eat tend to be high sugar, low fat. Uh, so they just they just eat more of them. And that's why suet is a great choice. Uh, they, everything like suet, um, woodpeckers, blue jays, uh, warblers, bluebirds, chickadees, titmice, nuthatches. Um, it's sort of universal. Um, and most things like just black oil sunflower seeds are really high in fat, really nutritious. Um, you don't have to get really any fancier than that. A question from uh, Charlene in uh, in Newton about uh, bird flu and uh, uh, does that affect managing feeders? Is that something that we, we have had situations in the past where we've been told to take our feeders down for, for a good reason? Uh, what do we need to know about bird flu and any or anything else with our feeders? Yeah, that's a good question. And that question was a big one. Um, this time last year is when the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak be, kind of got into the news and there were some geese that were tested positive out here on the cape um and it, it hasn't ended up being a huge deal here in massachusetts except if you keep poultry and it's it stayed in the news as a big problem for the poultry industry because obviously you're just creating an epidemiological nightmare by keeping that many birds just the way we the way we do agriculture with you know all over the world with millions of birds kind of packed together that's um a really great situation for pathogens to spread around so what's happened with this uh, the bird flu in the last 10 years or so is it's been jumping it jumps back and forth between wild birds and domestic birds and um it's just, it gets, it, it can change. And you, just like we see with COVID, it can get more um, pathogenic. It can transmit easier as it changes, but it's just passing back and forth between domestic flocks and, and wild flocks. It's not something you need to, to actually answer the question. It's not something that you have to worry about with your bird feeders so much. It's not, it doesn't seem to affect songbirds right now. It's really waterfowl hawks were getting affected things like ospreys and eagles there was some concern it was getting into seabird colonies which are very densely packed and there were a lot of seabird colonies in europe that were seeing a lot of um a lot of mortality and there were some in the great lakes caspian tern colonies in the great lakes where there was a lot of mortality and we're sort of biting our nails waiting to see what will happen this year it's still out there it's certainly still affecting domestic birds um, but it's not so much a bird feeder issue for your average person. Well, that is, uh, we're at the end of our time. I'm sorry for the questions we didn't get to. Um, grateful for these wonderful questions that we got. Thank all of you so much. Uh, Mark, before we go, one thing I want to make sure, can you uh, give people, give out your your, your website again? So it's a great website. And uh, for people who, who want to know more uh, beyond, beyond the Audubon, uh, where, where, can, where can they find that? Uh, well, um, you know, I work for Mass Audubon at uh, Mass Audubon Cape Cod, either the Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary or the Long Pasture Sanctuary. You can certainly look us up. And then I'm out here on WCAI, Cape and Islands NPR station, um, CIA, CAI.org. Who knows? I don't know, I'm on some radio station. <laughs> Figure it out. No, just kidding. The CAI is great. I do the weekly bird report there and also a monthly call in show. You can. If you have further questions, you can call. Try to stump me on the call-in show live on the air. There, it's great. It's, it's 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 an awesome show. Thank you, thank you so much. There, there there's nobody again. I'd, I'd want to talk about uh, winter birds with uh, with more. We we deeply appreciate it. No problem. Happy to do it. And thanks to all of you for for joining us. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>